So I do want to take just a moment. Um, when David said, and you may not have known this was going on, but when David said that about six weeks ago, five weeks ago, uh, all the plans for D now kind of got blown up. Uh, he wasn't kidding. Uh, we were going to go into partnership with several churches. They they kind of fell out of that, and all of a sudden David was left with the proverbial bag that he was holding. And uh, I just want to tell you what a fantastic job. Now, he, he recognized all the volunteers. He recognized all those that taught, all of those that prayed, all of those that gave. I mean, he tried to hit everybody, but he didn't take any credit for himself. And David, I just want, where are you, David? Just stand up. Stand up. This church has a great youth pastor, and he loves those kids, and uh, not perfect. We gave him two minutes for the video, and he took four. But um, aside from that, I mean, you know, some of the going a little overtime can be forgiven. I'm, I'm setting you all up if we go over later today. But um, no, he did a fantastic job, and make no mistake about it, he's the one that organized and got everything together and ran everything, and he... And he but he was also smart enough to, to give away some of that, you know, uh, authority. Hey, you go do this, take care of it. And uh, he trusted his folks, and they did a great job for him. And so uh, I'm just really proud of you, David. Uh, I know that uh, you're going to go home and sleep after this. He's already returned my jacket, so we're good. <laughs> Today we're going we're gonna, to uh, keep going in Hebrews. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And, and the title of the sermon today is A Promise remains. Uh, last week when we opened up this section in chapter 3, uh, I told you that this was the beginning of the second exhortation, the first exhortation that the writer to the uh, book of Hebrews, uh, the writer had put uh, in chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, he was, he was encouraging the believers not to drift away from the word, not to allow themselves to, to fall into to habits where they are not spending time in the Word or, or uh, feeding themselves with the Word of God. And now he gets to this second exhortation, as we talked about last week, he is encouraging or warning uh, the readers not to uh, fall into disbelief or unbelief, to ensure that uh, in their lives they are truly believing in Christ. And, and he gave an example from the Old Testament uh, Really, uh, Psalm 95 is, is uh, referencing back to uh, the Exodus when the nation of Israel, having been brought out of Egypt, gets all the way up to the promised land, the, the land that God had, had uh, said that He was going to give them, the, the promised rest that He had uh, told them about. When He gets them up to that point, after all of the miracles that they had seen, all of the things they had seen God do in, in their lives, they get up to this point and they send in the 12 spies, and 10 of them come back and say, we can't take the land. The people there are too big. There's giants in the land. It's everything you said it was, but, but we can't do it. Now understand, he's already defeated the Egyptian army. He's, he's split the waters. They've walked through on dry land. He's brought water from a rock a couple times. He has split open the earth and, and swallowed up people in their disobedience when they made the golden calf. I mean, he has shown the miracle after miracle after miracle, and they still got up to that point of entering into the promise that he had given them, and they were faithless. Their unbelief, in fact, chapter three, or chapter 3, verse 19 says, they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. They were not able to go into that promised rest, that promised land that God had told them about. And so they wandered for 40 years, 38 if you're actually keeping strict ta um, tabs on it, till all in that generation, save Caleb and Joshua, passed away, and then a new generation enters into the rest or the, the promised land that God had given them. Now, part of what we talked about last week also was that there are two and a third rest that we're going to talk about today, two rests that he references there. There's God's Sabbath rest that on the seventh day in Genesis 2-2 when he had completed creation, he rested from all of his works because everything was perfect. And I meant to say this last week, and I didn't. When God created everything and put Adam and Eve in the garden and set them there and, and gave them dominion over the earth, everything for a brief moment was perfect. 
Sin had not entered into the world as of yet. Man had not fallen yet. And God rest, rested from his labors. And that Sabbath rest is promised to us. We see it in this passage when the writer uh, in verse 9 of chapter 4 talks about a Sabbath rest that's waiting for us, a promised rest that God has for us. Now the second rest that the nation of Israel didn't get to enter into the land for was a, a rest of submission. When Joshua completes taking the land in the book of Joshua in the last few chapters, he says, listen, God has given us rest from our enemies on all sides. And in Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and, and Leviticus and everywhere, God kept saying, if you'll just believe in me and if you'll just follow my commands, I will give you rest. I will, you'll be fine. It always amazes me but in, that in Deuteronomy he says, but when you chase after other gods, but when you no longer keep my commands, but when, then he lists out all the things that are going to happen to the people uh, of Israel. And all of those things do happen as recorded in the Old Testament. And so God has planned a rest for us. Did you all know that? I mean, you think, you get up every morning, especially on Mondays, and you think, oh, I got to go to work or I got to do this. I hope there's no Mondays in heaven. <laughs> but the invitation that God has given us, the, the invitation that Christ gave us was, included a rest for our very souls. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, can I tell you that a lot of times as Christians, we're pushing too hard against that yoke. God said, I'll, if you'll just trust me, if your faith will be demonstrated in, in following me and believing in me and trusting me, you're not going to have the same difficulties that you think you're you have today, and that an unbeliever certainly has. See, through faith in Christ, we also have rest for our minds. Sometimes we overthink things. I've never been accused of that, but sometimes we overthink things. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, each one of you, I hope that you can look back on a time in your life when things were particularly uh, turbulent. And you can find that God provided this promise because you believed Him. When I first got here, I mean, I know you all remember they had to take the tumor out of my head. And I, and I think I told you all that um, one of the doctors had said uh, that there was a 40% chance that you might die on the table. And, you know, so that's a pretty big decision when you're going to go in and they're going to cut your head open. And Sarah and I prayed about it and we talked about it. And there was a peace that was there because we knew that no matter what happened, God was there. If I were to die, I was going to go to heaven. If I were to live, then I got to pastor this church. How could I lose? Well, some of you might think that I would lose on pastoring the church, but that's beside the point. Man, I get to do this. And that peace that he promises us is there. And you know that beside the rest for your souls and for your mind, God promises a rest for our body. In Isaiah 40, 31, he says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. I, I keep expecting chariots of fire music to start when I read this passage. But in this life, God promises us through Christ that it will lead to eternal life with Him in heaven and we'll have rest for our souls. He's still warning us, though, to be careful that we don't miss out on that because of unbelief. Let's stand in honor of reading God's Word as we read chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author writes, Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. 
But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united in faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through, no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. You may be seated. So God's provision, you can see this in the first three verses here as we get into this. God has provided the good news to the people of Israel. He provided it. I mean, sometimes people would, used to tell me the good news is only the New Testament. But I can tell you that every word from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-20 is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the good news proclaimed. You can't just go to the New Testament and say, well, that's the good news in the Old Testament we forget about. Because after all, it was the Old Testament that they used to witness to people when they were uh, talking to people after Jesus was resurrected. He, in fact, on the road to Emmaus, went back to the Old Testament and showed all of the things that were said about him in the Old Testament that had to come true. And so the writer here is referencing really the Old Testament when he says that the gospel was given to them. The nation of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they saw time and time again God's hand delivering them, providing for them, watching over them, protecting them, fighting for them. And yet when they get to the land that He's promised them, he said, they go, we can't do it. And you have to wonder, why the failure? Why did they fail to believe? Perhaps they were depending on good works. I mean, we all know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, not by works, lest you boast. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's not by works, but by faith that you're saved. And, and this gospel message can be seen as early as Genesis 3.15, when God promises that the seed of woman would crush the serpent's head. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. And so perhaps they were depending on their good works. Perhaps the nation of Israel, when they got up to the promised land, were depending that, that God was going to take them to heaven because, after all, He called them their people. His people, I mean. He said, these are my people. And after all, they thought, man, we, we, we're part of God's family. And yet, because of their disbelief, they were not able to enter. What about this church that we're... That we're uh, reading about the Hebrews that this letter is written to. Difficulties have arisen and all of a sudden these that had given their life to Jesus are, are being uh, persecuted and, and they're, they're carrying burdens and they're beginning to wonder, was our faith really put in the right thing? Should, shouldn't we go back to the old way? And, and maybe today, maybe today you're facing a difficulty Maybe today you're, you're facing a burden. Maybe today you have a crisis in your life. Maybe today you just look at the world and you go, man, this whole God thing, maybe it's just not real. What the writer is trying to tell you is don't fail in this moment. Therefore, let us fear if while the promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Don't fail in the moment that God is about to bring it about. And maybe, maybe these people just had rejected what they saw of God. John 1, 11 and 12 writes about Christ. He came to his own, 
And those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believed in his name. But he says right up in front, he came to the children of Israel and they rejected him. They didn't see him as the Savior. They didn't recognize him as the King of Kings because they had a preconceived idea of what he was going to be. And maybe this church was, was having second thoughts on that. Maybe that's why they were in danger of failing. And maybe today you have a preconceived idea of who Christ is. Maybe, maybe you've heard that if you just give your life to Jesus, everything is going to be fine. Is that right, Katha? Maybe if, if you give your life to Jesus, you're going to have no more problems. That, that's not it. Unfortunately, that's not the way it is. I can give my life to Jesus and I don't have to do anything after that. That's wrong too. Christ expects your whole life. It's just when you go through those difficulties, you have that peace that is beyond understanding that comes over you in the midst of that trial or that tribulation. Maybe that's why they failed. Maybe they were just faithless. Look at verse 2. For indeed, we, he's talking to the church now, have had good news preached to us just as they did. Just as the nation of Israel had that good news preached to them, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith by those who heard it. See, this good news, this gospel message is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago as it was 8,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or 4,000 or however many years back it goes. From the very beginning when God put Adam into the Garden of Eden and he fell and then he's put out, there was going to be a way that man could come back through belief in God and trusting in Him. But it says they heard it, but they didn't unite it with faith. They didn't put that faith into action. The first, well, <laughs> the first difficulty arises and they run. You can say the first difficulty was the Egyptians chasing after them and they complained. God took care of that. They get past the water and they, they complain because they're thirsty and God takes care of that. They get to the next difficulty and God takes care of it. And finally God says, here's the land, go take it. I'm going to be, I'm going to be with you. And they said, we can't do it. The first difficulty arises in our life. And we say, God, where are you? Do you know that that's faithless? God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you wherever you go. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go into difficult circumstances or situations. Believe me, when, when they said 40% chance of dying on the table, it caught my attention. I mean, that would catch anybody's attention, right? Oh, it's easy for you to say, Pastor, you're on the other side of that. You didn't have any trouble. Well, I just had peace. I either trusted him or I didn't. I either knew that he was going to... I mean, honestly, I, I knew that this was where I was supposed to be. I knew he was going to bring me here. So I went into that surgery thinking, you're going to get me through it, Lord, because you have something for me to do. But I still thought about it. What if, what if I do die? Well, the insurance was up to date. Everything was good. Sarah would probably be better off financially if I had. She would have mourned me terribly, and it would just have been horrible for her. Look, the message to us is the same. You can believe in who Jesus is, but you better trust him also. Even the demons believe and they shudder. They know who Christ is. They have no avenue back. We're told who Christ is, but we better believe it. And they enter by faith. He says, for we who have believed, verse 3, have entered that rest just as he has said. He's talking to the church now. He says, we've entered because we believe. And then he puts it up against those that didn't. Just as I swore in my wrath, he's quoting from Psalm 95, they shall never enter my rest. He's saying, just as we are entering into that rest because we believe in Christ and we have put faith to that belief, those that didn't enter into the promised land, they didn't enter because they didn't believe. And God said, they will never enter my rest. 
those who reject God will receive his judgment. You see, his works have been completed since the foundation of the world. And this is where it gets beyond me sometimes. God knew I was going to say yes and accept him. God knows he was going to say no. And yet you still have the ability to accept him or to deny him. His his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. God's provided the way for us to enter into that rest. The good news of Jesus Christ. All you have to do is hear the message. And you either accept it, believe it, and then follow it up by faith. There has to be evidence of a changed life in you. Or you don't believe. Now you may say you believe, you may walk down an aisle, you may pray a prayer, you may get into the baptismal waters. But as James said, show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. There can't be just a verbal assent that you believe in Jesus. There has to be action in your heart. There has to be action in your life. There has to be evidence of a changed life. When you see that person coming down the street, you say, I hate that person. God, would you help me to forgive that person and to love that person? Y'all were, talked, y'all were taught this, this whole weekend about pouring love out. And, and 1 Corinthians 13 keeps no record of wrongs as one of the aspects of love or the, or the, the uh, um, characteristics of love. So what does that mean? You see that person you don't like walking down the street. What do you got to do? God, help me not to keep a record of that wrong. Help me to forgive that person. And you'd be amazed at how many people go, I just cannot forgive what they did to me. And you're in bondage because you won't trust that God will take that away from you. Just trust that he will do it. If you say you believe in him to, to resurrect you from the dead and to take away your sins then trust that he will also be able to work in your life to take away those things that are keeping you from having the full relationship with him that he desires for you, the rest that he has prepared for you. Oh, we make it too hard. We make it too hard. See, God has a plan. Look at verses 4 through 7. Look at the practices and the prophecy in verse 4 and 5. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So he's looking at both of those things. The writer is uh, quoting Psalm 95. And he, and he gets back to Genesis 2.2. And he says, On the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on that seventh day from all his work that he has done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it and set it apart. And he said, This is the rest that you have coming. We're not there yet, but this is the rest that is to come. And then he quotes that those that don't believe, they'll never enter my rest. And that's the prophecy. And it's just as valid today. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you don't believe in his power, if you don't believe that he's king, if you don't believe that he's Lord over all, if you don't believe that he's taken away your sins, if you don't believe that he can change your life, if you don't think he can make you a new creation, then you are damned to hell. That's me speaking truth, that's prophetic. I'm not making it up on my own. I'm just going with what the Bible has to say. Church, we, we better demonstrate that we believe, that we believe, that we believe by how we live. It's got to happen. Or else there is a promise of you shall never enter my rest. Matthew chapter 7, many of you are going to come up to me in the last days, Jesus says, and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do all manners of good work in your name? And he's going to look at you and he's going to go, depart from me, I never knew you, because you did all of that in your own power, you did all of that under your own, guys, you never trusted me with that, you never asked me what you wanted me to do. Satan's a great deceiver, you wonder how they did all that? The only thing I can come up with is they were deceived in it. Or they're telling me that they did all that. Next week we're going to talk about the Word of God as living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That it can see the very intent of your heart. So if you come up and try to pull one over on Jesus, he's going to say, "Uh uh-uh. 
you weren't really mine. You may have said you are, but you didn't really trust me. See, there's a promised rest that remains for those who believe. And belief has got to be followed by action. Verse 6, we see the pardon. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. This is the pardon. There remains a day for those who believe. The door is open. The pardon is there. When you accept that Jesus died for your sins, was put into a grave and rose on that third day and defeated sin and death, when you accept that and you give your life to Him, your life is no longer your own. He takes away your sins and that pardon is given. John 3, 18, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then he sets a priority in verse 7. And we talked about this last week because he, he quotes this again. He says again, he fixes a certain day. Today. Today. Saying through David after so long a time, just as it has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The writer writing to the church here is saying, today, church, and me standing up here today, and those that might be listening online, it's today. If you hear the truth of God's word, don't harden your heart. If you have a yeah but in your mind right now, that should scare you. Yeah, but. I don't like that person. Yeah, but. I'm in the midst of difficulty. Yeah, but. God, you can't take care of this obstacle. Yeah, but. Why am I having to go through this, God? Yeah, but. If you have that, that promise of rest is still looming, but today, make it a priority. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Proverbs 29.1 says, Those who harden their hearts will be destroyed. Now, he says it about a neck, but 29.1 says, A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. And I could go to quote after quote about this. Church, the priority is today. The need is today. We have to demonstrate through our belief that we trust God in everything. See, a promise remains for us if we will truly trust Him. If we, be, if we say we believe, then we have to trust Him. That belief has got to be followed with action. Look at God's promise in verses 8 through 11. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He delineates the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest. If you were in Sunday school this morning, there was a verse on your, on your board. John 10, 3. It was, it was the second part of that verse. First part says, the doorkeeper opens the gate. And then he says, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. I think that as you look at that verse, and you need to look at it in context, but the writers did not do things by accident under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The sheep in the sheep pen hear his voice, but only his sheep follow him out. You understand that, right? It's really not a game that we're playing. There's a rest, there's a promise rest waiting for us. He says, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. A finished home for us. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work as God 
did from his. God's promised rest includes fellowship and harmony with him. Now we have the submission rest here on this earth. We have the Sabbath rest that's promised to us when he calls us home. And this is the rest that we look forward to. To be in fellowship with him and in harmony with him. To be in his presence. To have finished the work that he's given us on this earth. And to find a rest with him. He gives us a final warning in verse 11. He says, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fail through following the same example of disobedience. Now, he's writing to a church of believers. And you think, how can he say these things? Because under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he knew that they were in danger. That there were some that were in danger of not entering into this rest because they may have said that they believed, but they didn't live it out in the way they should have. There was not evidence of a changed life. There was bitterness within the ranks, potentially. There was uh, jealousy. There was envy. There was slander. If you're on Wednesday night, come and listen to the list in Romans of all of the things that, uh, that Paul writes there. In Corinthians, he talks about a list of things, and he says, such you once were all of these things. Malicious, gossips, hater of uh, your parents, hater of mankind. I mean, he lists them all out. And you, you're, you're reading them, and you sit there and think, oh, I'm glad I'm not like one of those. And then he says, but you used to be like this. But because of Christ and what he did for you, you're different. Well, the writer here is saying essentially the same thing, except you better make sure that you're not still one of those. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. When you get up to that obstacle, when you get up to that difficulty, when you get up to that that seems impossible to overcome, when you receive that diagnosis that you don't want to hear, when relationships are falling apart, when finances seem to be uh, plummeting, when all of these things seem to happen, I'm not telling you that God is going to miraculously change all of those things. I'm going to tell you that He's going to help you get through all of those things. But when you get to that point of need, you have to trust Him. And there may be difficulties. If there weren't, Paul wouldn't have written in uh, 2 Corinthians the list of all the things that's happened to him. Beaten with rods, beaten with the cat of nine tails, shipwrecked, in danger for his life. I mean, all of these things he went through, all for preaching the gospel and proclaiming the gospel. And yet, in all of those things, he never wavered in his faith and his trust. Are you tired? There's a promise of rest. Are you in need? That promise is certain. And there's no rest outside of Christ. There's none. There's nothing but sorrow and disappointment and bitterness and anger and greed. And I mean, you can, you can name the list off. The power of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, will give us rest for our souls. We just have to trust Him and live out that life that He's, that he's called us to live. It'll give us rest for our minds in those difficult times when you, when you feel overwhelmed and you ask Him to, to give you that peace. He will do that. He'll eventually give us rest for our bodies. A seminary professor of mine, whom I love, uh, he would always say, there's time to rest in heaven, Jim. And there is. This is the same guy. I mean, he's Jeff and Audrey. Well, he's Audrey Medina's father. But he's the same guy that was preaching, uh, had a heart attack about 10 minutes before he finished. He, he said he got a little too vigorous in his proclamation of the word. And he started to have a heart attack. He felt it, finished, gave the invitation, 
then walked to the back and called his wife and said, hey, I think I'm having a heart attack. Take me to the hospital. She was a little mad at him. But there's time to rest in heaven. You know, if you, if you, if you trust Christ and live that out, you'll be more effective as a Christian because people will see how you handle difficulties and they'll want what you have and you'll have an opportunity to tell them, it's not me, it's Christ in me. A person with a tired soul, a tired mind, or a, or a tired body is unsatisfied and an unsatisfied person can be dangerous and harmful. Listen, a promise remains. Here's the final promise. Here's, here's the final thing. A promise remains. But in order to have this, this rest, we have to trust completely in the person and in the work of Jesus. And we have to allow that to be lived out in our lives in every circumstance, in every difficulty, in every obstacle. You have to trust that Christ is there with you and that he'll get you through it. And so I want to leave you with this question. Are you trusting him today? Are you trusting him? There's no other way to quote the song than to trust and obey. Fathers, we uh, close this time. I do thank you for your word. I do thank you for the truth of it. I, I pray, Father, that as we come to this time of invitation, that, Lord, as you work in people's lives, that you would give them the peace that they desire, that they would feel your comfort and presence as they yield things that they've been holding on to and put them on your shoulders, as they take their burdens and put them uh, at your feet, as they trust you with, with their very lives, Lord. I pray that they would see the difference and feel the difference, and, and Lord, that they would live the difference in a dark and dying world, Lord, so that others might know who you are and come to a saving knowledge of you. Lord, we ask this in your son Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.